Oh, man. <laughs> Going to give it just a minute and see if Elias can get the, the PowerPoint going. If not, we'll go ahead and get started. I remember when I was a young man, uh, the preachers used to do the flannel boards. You remember the flannel boards? The flannel boards, where they would take the little flannel backing stickers and put them up there with their messages. I remember they used to do the flannel board lessons. This was before whiteboards, okay? So, wow. That's when I was a kid. Yeah, yeah. I remember they used to have the chalkboard. They would pull down or pull up behind the pulpit, and it was effective. You didn't have to worry about if uh, the internet service went down for that. <laughs> Technology is great until it doesn't work and then it's a nightmare. It's, and so it doesn't look like you guys are going to get to see Heidi's wonderful PowerPoint she put together for me last week that I just added to this week, but uh, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh-oh, we have some activity behind me. I, I didn't see any right there. Well, we will. We'll go ahead and get started with a prayer, so if you would, bow with me. Dear Father, we are grateful for this day. We are thankful for all the blessings of life. We are just thankful that you love us, and that's, that's really all we need in this world is your love and your mercy. And your grace, Father, and we're thankful for that. We're thankful for you allowing us to wake up this morning with the level of health that we have, that we can come here, we can study from your word, Father. We, we realize, Father, that it's your word is the absolute truth, and it is our guide through this life to the next. And we pray that we study this with an open mind, open heart, because we realize, Father, that it's only through your Son we have a hope for eternal life with you. We pray all these things through his precious name. Amen. Okay, so does anyone remember what book we're studying? <laughs> anyone from last week? All right, so must have made a great impression. Haggai, I heard it over to the side over here. Great impression. All right, so we can get at least in the right book. All right. <laughs> okay, is that in the Old Testament or the New Testament? <laughs> okay, so we know we're going to go back to the Old Testament. We know we're going to study Haggai, so we're, we're at least in the ballpark, right? So I'll ask another question. Earl has, has uh, motivated me to have a question and answer, but I'm going to do it in a quiz form, so you should remember from last week. So I'm a little more demanding than he is. He, he's a little more patient with us. Uh, what, do you remember what, the, what we believe uh, his name might mean, or at least the root of Haggai? What is, do you remember the association with that? What did that mean? Festival, festive, joyous, joyous one. And so we have some, at least someone who paid attention last week. Uh, not that that's even important as far as what his name means, but oftentimes we see through Scripture that God uses people whose names actually line up with their message or with who they are or where they're from. And so it's, you know, it all interconnects. I always say there's not a single word in the Scripture that's not important, that doesn't have meaning. Sometimes we may not know what that is, but there's some kind of connection there. All right, so we talked about that. And last week we went through chapter 1. We went through the history of Haggai, and we went through about the time frame that he prophesied in. We went through, um, uh, it was around 520 B.C. when he prophesied, uh, and he was, he was uh, talking to the people the, um, the children of Judah and Israel who had come back from Babylonian captivity. So this is post-captivity prophecies. Okay, and so the first part of his sermon, his lesson is basically that. It's a sermon. He's saying, listen to what I'm saying. This is from God. 
But listen to what I'm saying. This is what you need to do. He's given them heedings. He's given them warnings. He's given them information they need to, to do to uh oh, I see some activity back here. Uh, I'll be ready, so I'm going to turn this on, so I will be ready. Um, he's given them some warnings, but the second part he gives of the prophecy of what's going to come. And like I, I mentioned on multiple occasions, I like to kind of end on that positive, uplifting note. And that's what God's message through Haggai does for these people. Is he, get, he ends with this positive, uplifting message. And that is, let's see. Seeing if these are together because they. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. No, no. I'm frightened. <laughs> yeah, he, Ellis is doing a great job back there. Okay, I'm, I'm lost it here. But that's where we, we got to actually the end of last week. Here we go. Now we're there and it. It's flashing on me. So he gives them four messages basically. We went through the first message last week. Okay, and he talks about how they needed to change their ways and they needed to get to work because they've been kind of lazy. Remember, they came back and they were supposed to start rebuilding the temple. And they had kind of started a little bit, got things prepared, and then it had been 16 years since they had really... Now, this is confusing me, Elias. This is going something up here. This is something different. I'll some more <laughs> uh, I'm easily confused, so that's why. Okay, so he gives them this message to get to work. That was our kind of our point last week. Get to work. You know, quit being lazy. Quit being complacent. Quit putting yourself, because remember, they had built their own houses. They had these nice, lavish places to live, but the temple was still laying in, in shambles. And so they were being um, corrected for that. And now going into chapter 2, which is only two chapters in the book, we're looking at the next three messages he gives. The next message he gives is, I, I titled it, Consolation. In the book it says, Consolation to those remembering the glory of Solomon's temple. And this is verses 1 through 9. This one over there. And so, one thing too there in verse 1 of chapter 2 of Haggai, it says, In the seventh month, on the twelfth, excuse me, 21st of the month, the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet, saying, you remember I mentioned that last week, they, they, the, the, the author of this book calls those, those oracles, or other words, those timelines. Uh, in, in this particular book, God, for whatever reason, gives a specific timeline of when things are happening. So he says, this is when it happened. And Haggai is giving this message. And then he says, uh, speak now, this is verse 2, speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying. And so remember, we mentioned this last week, this was a message from God through Haggai to two people primarily, the leaders. So you had the governmental leader, Zerubbabel, and you had the religious leader, Joshua. Okay? And so that's pretty significant, okay? He's not just speaking to the general audience of the children of Israel or, or Judah. He's speaking to those specific people, to specific people, as well as the people. And so there's a significance in that, in that he wants to be sure we get the leadership right. Because that was a problem. We talked about that. Issues typically start where? At the head, right? So if it's the government, if it's a company, if it's a family, the problems start at the top. And then they trickle down and things happen from there. That's where typical things come from. So he's telling these two men, listen, and, and Haggai's speaking to them, and then they're portraying all this information out to the people. Verse 3, who is left among you who saw this temple in former glory? And how do you see it now in comparison with it? Is this not... 
Is this not in your eyes as nothing? And so the time frame from the time the temple was destroyed when they went into Babylonian captivity to the time frame we are now with Haggai is about 66 years because they hadn't quite all come back from Babylonian captivity. How long was the Babylonian captivity in total? 70. 70 years. And so we're getting to the end. So there's one more group of people coming back. And we're going to see that's we see that in Nehemiah. OK. And so they're almost at the end of that captivity. It's been 66 years since the, the temple has been destroyed. There's still people in this group who remembered seeing the old temple. So we know they're at least right around 70 because surely maybe at four or five years old they would remember it. I can remember things when I was four or five years old. Especially if I saw the glory of the temple and now I see it again and it's not so glorious. And if you go back and if you remember back in Ezra when they were talking about this same time frame in Ezra's account, what happened? What did these older men do when they saw the new temple? They wept. They wept. They cried. They broke down because they're like, man, I remember how great this was and now look at it. But if you also remember in Ezra, the younger people were joyous. They were happy. And it was that bittersweet moment. The temple had been rebuilt, but the people who had seen it before knew it just wasn't the same. Brother Charlie. Is uh, a clear fact uh, that they expected more when they hadn't done more to deserve what God was giving them. Absolutely. And we should take a lesson away in regard to, it may not look good on the outside, but it's still the same God that provides for us on the inside. And that's what we're going to get to the point of this, is we look with these. God doesn't look with these human fleshly eyes, right? And he encourages us. <laughs> not to look with these human fleshly eyes, but to look for spiritual things. And that's what we're going to see a little later in the book. Okay. And so there, verse 4. Yet now, be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. And so this looked like nothing to the people who remembered it. But even though it looked like nothing in their fleshly eyes, God says, be strong. And what else does he say? Get to work again. He says, be strong and work. For I am with you. So it didn't look like much. Just like Brother Charlie said, it didn't look like much in their eyes, but God was there. And so the small things of this life, the weaknesses that we have, as Paul says, are strength in God. That's hard for us to do sometimes, isn't it? Because we kind of get, I'm not strong enough for this. Well, I, I can't do that. That's too, that's, I'm not smart enough to do that. I'm not knowledgeable enough in the Bible to do X, Y, and Z. But we're still in our fleshly world. We still battle with it every day. Paul battled with it. You know, he was pulled all the time. That's encouraging to us because Paul was an apostle who was, had direct revelation. And he still struggled with the flesh. And they were still in that state. But he tells them to be strong. He tells not only the two leaders, but everyone, be strong. What does it indicate to you when someone says, you need to be strong? What is that? When you're in a situation, you need to be strong. Courageous. Courageous. Difficulties are still coming. This was hard, trying to get this all together, trying to build this temple, trying to organize all these people, trying to push out the people who are against us. But you've got to be strong because there's still a lot of work to do, and it's going to be difficult. Sounds like a pretty good message for us, too. And then down there in verses, starting in verses 5, according to the word, the, the covenant with you when you came out of Egypt, 
so my spirit remains among you. So he's going back in verse in verse uh, verse five. There he's remember the same promises I made to you in Egypt when you came out. How long had, had that been since they came out of Egypt and they come out of of uh, Babylonian captivity? Hundreds of years. So we're talking probably eight hundred years. And he says. Remember those promises? Remember how, how I told you I was going to take care of you when you came out of Egypt? That same promise stands today. So we can look at that and say the same promises Jesus made to us 2,000 years ago, those promises still stand today because God's with us. And down there in verse 7, I like these next two, two, three verses. It says, And I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations and I will fill this temple or this house with glory says the Lord of hosts the silver is mine the gold is mine says the Lord of hosts the glory of this latter temple or house depending on what uh, translation you have shall be greater than the former says the Lord of hosts and in this place I will give peace says the Lord and so here we get almost seems conflicting right God said uh, through the inspired word, it said they were they were sad. The temple was almost nothing, but God says a little bit later, in a couple of verses, this temple will be more glorious than the previous. Again, if we think from our human eyes and our human mind and the fleshly, that seems contradictory. But as usual, God's not talking in the flesh; He's speaking to us in spiritual sense. Now there is some physical things going on there. There are the human beings involved, but he's not talking about necessarily the physical temple that they're seeing now. He's talking about the future temple. What is the temple of God today? Two things. The church is the temple of God. That's what we're involved in. We are a part of. And what am I? I'm the temple of God, right? You are the temple of God. So because God dwells, all the temple was was where God dwelled yeah. on earth, right? Yeah. Now, God doesn't dwell on earth fleshly in a fleshly physical temple. Unless you want to talk about my spirit and your spirit. He dwells within us, so within the church. So when he talks about that future temple that will be of greater glory, very well it could be me as an individual. Or me as a member of the church, collectively. And so, I don't know if they understood that completely at that time. But, we can look back because we know the answer. We know what happened and what, why things happened. We know those things. Um, I, I like the, and I don't know, someone read, to, someone have a different version. I'm reading from the New King James. Um... Someone who has the ESV, could you read uh, verse 7 for me there? Let's see. Um, chapter 2? Yes, Haggai chapter 2, verse 7. Chapter 2. Haggai. And I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in, and I will find this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. And so that is used the word treasures of all nations. And in, in, in my Bible, it has desire of all nations. That is capitalized. This is why if we, if we go forward into the New Testament, it's capitalized because in, in my translation, because I think there's some uh, people who disagree on what necessarily this is talking about. I think it's pretty obvious as we get through the rest of the book, the desire of all nations or the treasure of all nations is not necessarily what they possess. What do all nations want? Or what will all nations, all men, all civilizations want in the future from this standpoint? What will they want? What is the glory of God? It's talking about Jesus, right? All nations will desire him. See, at this time, God was through the Jews. But in future, in this future temple, 
the desire of all men will be Jesus. In other words, all races, all civilizations will desire that. It's not just that physical gold and silver. And we're going to see that as we get on down. That's what he's referring to. So then we go into the next, his third message. This is from verses 10 through 19. It says, verse 10 there, on the 24th day of the ninth month, then again, he's very specific on when this is happening. The second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Now ask the priest concerning the law, saying, If one carries holy meat in the fold of his garment, and with the edge of the touches of bread or stew with, or wine or oil, or any food, will it become holy? Then the priest answered and said, No. And Haggai said, If one who is unclean because of a dead body touches any of these, Will it be unclean? So the priest answered and said, It shall be unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, So is this people, and so is this nation before me, says the Lord. And so is every work of their hands, and what they offer there is unclean. And so this kind of seems like a complete change, right? It's like, his, where is Haggai going? It's like he's going down this road, he's telling us about the temple, he's talking about this stuff, and all of a sudden he starts talking about clean food and Clothing, and well, he's saying, what's the state of this people? And so he, he asks them questions. So Haggai is asking the priest these questions about the Jewish law. They knew the law, right? They knew it. That's the point number one up there. They knew the law. And so if you remember, if you go on further several hundred years when Jesus was in his ministry, he would ask these questions or he would give these examples or he would talk about and these Pharisees and these Sadducees and these leaders and these Jewish people did they know the law? They knew it. They knew it inside, outside, upside down. Okay, they knew all about it. But God wasn't worried about them knowing the law. He was worried about what was in here. And so he was saying the things you're bringing to me and your sacrifices they're unclean because you are unclean, okay? Um, someone turn uh, to Matthew chapter 9, verses 13. Matthew 9, verse 13. Brother Earl, can you get for me? Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. So who's that talking there? Jesus. That's Jesus talking, okay? And he's talking to this group of people here. This, these Pharisees, they were kind of ridiculing Jesus for what he was doing. He, you know, he was dealing with Matthew here, the tax collector. Anyway, and he was meeting with these people and, and interacting with these sinners. And so there, uh, Jesus is quoting from Hosea. He's saying, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And so the same thing these people were doing back in Haggai, they were doing their sacrifices. They were starting to, to, to get back into their spiritual worship. But it wasn't from here. So we can come in here every time the doors are open. And we can sing praises to God and we can read from his scripture and we can listen to sermons or on the first day of the week we can partake of communion. We can do all those things which are our sacrifice, our worship to God. But is God pleased with that? Only if we do it in spirit and truth. So that's exactly what was going on back then. They were doing it, maybe in truth, maybe they were doing it by the letter because we know the Pharisees were doing things beyond the letter. They were taking even further steps, but they weren't doing it in spirit. They weren't doing it from here. And so the people here, he was saying, he gives them this, Haggai gives them this real life example that they can understand. He's like, okay, if, if something's holy touches something unclean, is it unclean? And they're like, he was like, well, like, well, yeah. You know, so they knew those things. So, and then he was saying, that's what you are. I, I thought about David. When he had was going, uh, when he had made his decision to be with Bathsheba and have 
her husband killed. And then the, the prophet comes to him and gives him this real plain example that David knew really well, right? Because David was a shepherd. And at the end of this, you know, you know the, the story how he took the, the, the person's one little ewe lamb and, and sacrificed or offered it to his friend instead of using his own herd. And David was furious. And what did he say? I like it in the in newer version. You the man. <laughs> you are the man. Here's what Haggai's saying. Yeah, you know those things. But you're the one messing up. You're not doing it from here. Same thing with us today. We come in. We have to do. Uh, I talked about it this week. About mental preparation. Before we come to worship. We have to focus our mind. We have to get our heart in the right place. Get our mind in the right place. We have to. We come into worship. I can sing. I can have the best voice in the world. And sing the amazing praises. And it uplifts the people around me. But if it's not from here. That's right. I'm a clanging cymbal. That's according right. to Paul. And so the same thing we deal with today. The next section there is 15 through 19. It says, and now carefully consider from this day forward, from before stone was laid upon stone in the temple of the Lord. If you remember last week, there was two phrases, two times, not one phrase used two times. Uh, that, that was, it was an introspective phrase. Do you anyone remember what that phrase was that, that Haggai used when he was trying to make his point? He would say something. This was from God. Haggai didn't come up with this. God told him it was consider your ways. Remember that? Consider your ways. And here again in this, in this uh, verse 15 it says now carefully consider. And so that, that came up three different times in the, in the book of Haggai. In other words, stop. Think about what you're doing. Look at yourself. Don't look at this person, don't look at that person, don't look at your your spouse. Consider yourself. And he says, consider from this day forward. In other words, we can change things immediately. Do you believe that? Yes. It changes in the heart, right? It's a decision. And I used this example before. If you if you go back and look at the word decision, it comes from the root of incision. You know what an incision is when someone does an operation. It's an incision. In other words, a decision is you cut that apart and they're never together again. That's what a decision is. It means it's immediate. It's definite. And so we can change because he says from this day, in other words, immediately change. Be careful to consider. And so that's one thing that we have to reinforce in ourselves is I can change right now. Whatever it is, no matter how difficult you may think it is, it can be changed immediately. That doesn't mean you're going to struggle with it. Because they all, Satan's, Satan's good. He's good at what he does. He uses ways to trickle that stuff back into us, right? He hangs it in front of us. But the decision is still mine. And he's, here it says, carefully considered from this day forward. And it says, verse 16, Since those days when one came to a heap of twenty ephah, there was but ten. When one came to the wine vat to draw out fifty baths from the press, there were but twenty. I struck you with blight and mildew and hail and all the labors of your hands, yet you did not turn from, to me, says the Lord. So in other words, He's talking about what had been happening to them. They had come back. They were trying to do things, but they had got complacent. And he said, don't you remember all the things you did? You, you planted vineyards, and you pruned them, and you made you had your wine vats. You, you planted this grain, and you had uh, the heaps of grain to go and gather from. To look. And you should have had 50 but you only had 20. Or you should have had 20, but you only had 10. In other words, you're not being blessed because you're not doing what you're supposed to do. 
So when I look at myself, and I always try to do these things, I just keep on looking at myself and saying, okay, what's this telling me? What's this telling me? When things maybe are not the way I want them to be, maybe the problem is me. Right? Maybe the problem is me. I had a, a guy I worked with before I was a chiropractor. I used to work in a lab years ago. And I was talking to him one day, and, and he had been married five times. Mm-hmm. He was on his fifth marriage. And he, he, was a, he was a different kind of guy. <laughs> <laughs> but he was a different kind of guy. And we were talking about it. He would talk about how this wife had all this problem, and she had this. And I looked at him, and I said, how many times have you been married? He said, well, this is my fifth wife. And I said, have you ever thought maybe the problem's you? He kind of went, you know, you might be right, you know. But I'm glad he said that and didn't get all mad at me. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but maybe the problem's me. So when things are not going the way I think they should go, maybe the problem's me. Maybe it's exactly the way it should be going because of what I'm doing or what I'm, how I'm living or how... Or maybe it's the things that God exactly wants me to be able to go through so when things do really get bad, I'm, I'm prepared. So we always have this tendency to keep on thinking in the earthly world, right? It's like, man, I just don't, I just don't have a good job. You know, if I could just have this better job, you know, things would be better. I could, I could do this, I could do that. Or if I had more money or if I had more things or, if, you know what, if, if, if my wife just wasn't so ornery, I believe I could be happy. Heidi's not here, so I'm going <laughs> to lay on her. <laughs> Maybe she's ornery because it's me, right? If I had to put up with me, I'd be ornery. No, my wife is not ornery. You guys know that. But anyway, so he's saying you haven't been blessed because you haven't considered your ways. Verse 18, consider now from this day forward. There it is again, right? Consider now. Think about it now. From the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day that the foundation of the Lord Temple was laid, consider it. Is the seed still in the barn? As yet the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have not yielded fruit. But from this day, I will bless you. And so God's saying, when you make that decision, when you sever your old way, that incision, and never take it up again, and you decide, today's the day that I'm going to start doing the right thing. I'm going to start serving God. Today's the day. And I move forward from there. God says, from that day, I'll bless you. And that's exactly what he did. And that's exactly what he does today. The problem is that sometimes I don't know a blessing from an, when it's not a blessing, right? I think hard times are not blessings. James tells us we should be happy during trials, right? Because that's saying, you know, and I, I'm going to tell you, I'm not very good at this. But that's God saying, I got confidence in you. You're going to make it through this. Be happy. Be happy when things are hard. That's pretty tough. That's pretty tough. Now we get into the last one. We've got just a few minutes. I think it's going to work out great. The last message he had to them is he ends on this hope again. He, he alluded to it earlier that the desire of all nations will fill that temple. In other words, when Jesus comes, he's going to be in this temple, in this place where this temple is. He's going to be here. He's literally going to walk in here and the glory of all humanity and Godhead is going to be here. He talks about that early. But now as you get down here in the last one, he, he, he talks about it again. Verse 20. There's actually two messages here. He says, verse 20, And again the word of the Lord came to Haggai on the 24th day of the month. There he is again, giving a specific time frame. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake heaven and earth. So now this time, if you look, the message is to one man. That's interesting again. I find these little things, these little breaks to be fascinating when I read. I thought, hmm, I wonder why this was for two or three people. Why this one was the whole nation. Why this? Because he tells us what's going to happen. Verse 22. 
And that, that, here's that, that uh, phrase, shake heaven and earth, is pretty interesting because it's used more than once in the Bible. I will overthrow the th throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms. I will overthrow the chariots and those who ride in them. The horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. Who was Zerubbabel, remember? And just in Haggai here, who was, who was Zerubbabel? Governor. He was the governor, right? So he was the leader, governmental leader. He wasn't the spiritual leader. Mm -hmm. And so he goes back to Zerubbabel and he says, this is for you. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. All this stuff is going on around you. All these kingdoms, all these powerful nations. You know, I don't know exactly how old Zerubbabel was here. He, he may have seen the Babylonians. He may... I'm sure he saw the Persians and the Medes. He saw these powerful. He saw his own nation, how strong they were possibly. I'm not sure how old he was. He may not have been old enough uh, to see that. But he had seen powerful nations. And there was lots of things going around. People were being killed and nations were being overthrown. And he says, I will shake heaven and earth. In other words, God is saying, I have power in heaven, but I have power on earth as well. And so... I think, and this is just me speculating here, I think Zerubbabel probably knew what had happened in Babylon when it came in to take over, take over Judah and take over Jerusalem. He saw Nebuchadnezzar's power, and he saw him destroy and, and wipe out. Remember back in, in uh, Zephaniah, we talked about how everything was going to be wiped out, killed everybody. And he saw that, and he knew it, and he said, I have power on earth and in heaven. Remember Nebuchadnezzar? He had to learn that, right? Two times Daniel told him that. Um, let me see what... Daniel chapter 2. Remember Jan Daniel chapter 2. If you, and this is, I'll just go through it quickly. That's when Daniel was telling Nebuchadnezzar what his dream was, right? He talked about the golden statue, the golden head, and the... the the, the silver and the bronze and the clay and the iron and so on and so forth. He was saying, these are the, all these kingdoms. And so Daniel was prophesying about all these kingdoms that would come to pass. But at the end of that, he said, what happened? A stone came in and crushed all that into dust. And that stone was Jesus, right? That's a prophecy for messianic prophecy as well as a human prophecy. And so he was telling him, Nebuchadnezzar here, God has power over all these people, all these nations, all these powerful things that you can't even, you think, well, what are we going to do? We don't have a chance. God has power over that because he's ruling heaven. And if you go over there in Daniel chapter 4, remember the Daniel telling Nebuchadnezzar again, hey, you've got too much pride and you're going to be cast out. And remember, he lived out in the fields and had you on his back. And he said, until you realize God rules in heaven and earth, you're going to be out in the field. And it took, I think it was, we don't know exactly how long, but some speculate about seven years. And so he told Nebuchadnezzar, God rules in heaven and he rules in earth. I want to think Zerubbabel was aware of that. And here Haggai tells him again, tells Zerubbabel, God rules in heaven and earth. He's going to shake heaven and earth and he's going to wipe out all these people because my kingdom's coming. And then the last part, in verse 23, it says, In that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, says the Lord, and will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. Does anyone know what that means there, what he's telling him? If you go over into Matthew, let's go to Matthew chapter 1. And Brother Earl, since you've got the mic, I'll let you just read. Just, you know, just always make Pearl, Pearl, Earl, Earl read, read all the time. Uh, read Matthew chapter 1, verse 12. Listen closely. 
And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shetiel. Shetiel, the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel, the father of Abadu. Oh, that's good right there, or you can stop. I don't want to make you say all those names because that's mm -hmm. pretty hard. Mm -hmm. But this is him. See? Zerubbabel, the son of Shiatiel. It's the same guy we're talking about in Haggai. And so this is what, in my mind, I'm thinking God is telling Zerubbabel through Haggai, through you, Jesus is coming. What does that tell us? He had a change of mind. He made a decision. From this day forward, I'm going to do what God says. Now, I'm not saying he didn't make mistakes. He didn't, but we know he had a change of heart because God told him, you're going to be the lineage. Same way he told Abraham. Through you, all nations will be blessed. Through you, Jesus is going to come. Here he's telling Zerubbabel, through you. And so that, to me, that's really powerful. It's like, what does, how does that have to do with me? It's like he messed up. He wasn't doing what he was supposed to do because he was the leader and they were complacent as a nation. So it was his fault. It was just jo Joshua's fault because they were the leaders and they didn't motivate the people. But he changed. But he, I think he considered his ways, right? And so he says, you change, we will bless, I will bless you. And because you change, you're through who the world's going to be blessed. Now, I don't know exactly if Zerubbabel understood that exactly at that time, but I thought that was pretty amazing, is you can change. And when you decide to follow what God wants you to do, he's going to use you for great things. You may never know what those great things are. You may die one day having no clue. But one day we'll know, right? One day we'll know. So hopefully... Our study of Zephaniah and Haggai has been beneficial to us. And we can see that things that are written for the people thousands of years ago are very applicable to us today, as long as we're looking for it to be that way. So as we close, I'm going to have Brother Charlie, if he would, lead us in a closing prayer. Shall we go to our Father? Lord God of heaven and of earth, who continues to lift us up by the power of your word, and as we humble ourselves before thy great throne, thy grace and mercy is spread amongst all nations, that we might continue to be uh, that signet ring of greatness that is in uh, Christ Jesus our Lord. We ask and Father that you would be with uh, those who are traveling this morning, uh, those who have assembled at the uh, different houses of worship, uh, those who are in the highways and the byways that they too might be able to tune in uh, with the technology that you have prevailed and provided for us. We ask and Father that you would be with our little ones and old ones in like kind, that they might be able to find the comfort and the joy that we ourselves has found out uh, through the struggle of living, that your grace has abounded toward all men, irregardless of who they are and whatever their status is in life. Bless us and increase us this morning, uh, for that we have assembled before thee knowing that where two or three are gathered in your name, there are you in our midst. In your holy and devout ways, Father, forgive us of our sins continually, that we might found righteous in the day of your visitation. For this we ask in the high and holy name of him, who is like none other but Jesus the Son, whom we have our faith, love, and where it abides forever. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Once again, let us give God thanks for this another opportunity that we can come together this morning to magnify his name. Even though few we are this morning, a lot of our people are traveling, but thanks be to God that we are here Amen. to lift up his name above all other names. And I do hope and trust that we'll have a wonderful day of worship and that when all is done today, we can say thanks be to God for Jesus who make all this possible. Our first song this morning will be hymn number 377, Father Alone. Tempted and tried, where of me to wonder why it should be thus all the day long. Why there are Live in the 
sunshine will understand it all by and by when we see Jesus coming in glory when he comes from his home in the sky then we will see him in that bright mansion we'll understand it all by and by father alone will know all about it father understand what cheer up my brother live in the sunshine we'll understand it all by and by we do about in peace Father in heaven, once again, we come before you, Lord, giving you thanks, dear God, for this another Lord's Day morning, another day, O oh God, we are in which we can come together, dear God, to sing songs of praise and honor and glory unto your name, and to continue to uplift your name above all your name. Father God, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who make all this possible. By coming to this world, O oh God, the sinless one, O oh God, he have done so many things, yet he was ridiculed. He was despised. He was rejected of men. But Lord God, he had done no evil in his thoughts, no evil in his walking, O oh God, but yet they had put him to the cross. He had bled and he had died, dear God, but thanks be to God that he had paid a price for us, O oh God. And this morning we are here to give you thanks for all your love, your mercy, and your grace. Help us, O oh God, to Focus upon you each time of our life, O oh God, that as we go along, we might magnify your name and that we can be light unto others who is in this dark world of sin. We pray this morning, O oh God, for each and every one that gathered here. Help us, O oh God, that our coming together will be acceptable in your sight. We pray, dear God, that you might help us, O oh God, to focus upon you, O oh God. Forget about the things on the outside, O oh God, and to focus on you, O oh God, and to know that you are in control. You are here with us, O oh God, in the Spirit, and I pray, dear God, that you might inspire every heart, every soul, O oh God, that you might continue to lean upon your unchanging hands, because, O oh God, in times like these, there is no other way but your way, dear God. We pray for those who could not be here with us this morning, dear Father God. You know the reason why. I pray, dear God, that you might help them in every way, dear God, that you might continue to lean upon you, O oh God. For those who are sick, we pray, O oh God, a speed of recovery, if it's your will, dear God. For those who are traveling at this time, oh God, we have a lot of old folks that is traveling this morning. We pray, dear God, for traveling grace for them. We pray to keep them safe, dear God. And if it's your will, dear God, that you will bring them back to us safely, oh God, that at the next time appointed, we might all meet together to worship you. We pray, dear God, for those who mourn at this time, that you will comfort their hearts. Help them in every way, oh God, that they might be comforted, oh God, and to know that you are the God of our salvation, and you will not give unto one more than what they can manage. So at this time, dear God, we pray that you will take full control. Bless our coming together this morning. Bless our brother, dear God, who prepared his sermon to bring to us this morning. We pray that you will bring back to his memory the thing that he had studied, and that as we listen, O oh God, we might not be hearers only, but help us, O oh God, to put these things in our minds, in our thoughts, to use them as instrument of our lives, dear God that we know, God, that one day we can stand before you and to hear, well done, the good and faithful servant, if you only be faithful until death. So, Lord God, we leave our care in your hands at this time, that you will take full control, and that when all is over, oh God, we will say thanks be to God for Jesus who make all this possible. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. At this time, we'll have our scripture reading. I'd ask you to stand with me, please, as we read together.
The scripture reading this morning is taken from Psalms 121, verses 1 to 5. And can we read together, please? Lift up my eyes to the hills, from where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let you be moved. He will keep you in slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade upon your right hand. This is the word of the Lord. May the church say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Our next song will be hymn number 479, Mansion Over the Hilltop. I'm satisfied with just a cottage below, a little silver and a little gold, but in the city. Where the mansion will ride, I've got a gold one, and a silver line. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop, in that bright land where we'll never grow. And someday yonder we'll never more wander, but what the streets that are pure as gold, though often tempted, tormented and tested, and like a prophet. My pillar of stone, and though I find here no permanent dwelling, I know he'll give me a mansion my own. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop. In that bright land where we'll never grow And someday yonder we'll never more wander But walk the streets that are pure as gold Don't take me poor Deserted or lonely, I'm not discouraged, I'm heaven bound, I'm just a pilgrim in search of a city, I want a mansion, a robe and a crown. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never more go. And someday yonder we'll never more wander, but what the streets that our pure rescue. At this time we have a scripture reading in prayer. Good morning, church. Good morning. And a pleasant good morning to those who are listening virtually. This morning's uh, scripture reading will be taken from Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verses 7 through 9. And the word of the Lord reads as follows. For the mind 
that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Bow with me as we go to our Father in prayer. Our most gracious and heavenly Father, we come before your throne today thanking you for giving us another day to, to worship you and to praise your name and to partake of your communion and to sing praises unto you, Father. We thank you for giving us another opportunity just to assemble together and worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, we just thank you for all the many blessings that, that you have given to us that we so often disregard. And Father, as just as long as we draw breath, Father, we have an opportunity to just give you all the praise that you deserve. Father, we thank you for each and every saint that's in our midst this morning and those who are listening and within the sound of my voice. Father, we thank you for each visitor and for giving them an opportunity to, to hear your holy inspired word. We thank you, Father, for the church leadership and we ask that you just continue to grant us wisdom as we just strive to steer this congregation in the direction that is true to your holy inspired word, Father. Father, we ask you just to to grant those who are still on their way here uh, safe travels and, and traveling mercy. And we ask you to just comfort those who can't make it because they're, they're ill or sick and shut in. And Father, we ask you to be with those this morning among us who are just suffering in, in pain, Father, either spiritually or, or mentally or in mourning. Uh, those of us who are dealing with, with loss. Um, we ask you to be, of course, with the Boyd family as they deal with their recent loss. Father, we ask you to be with those of us who are dealing with these continual health issues. Um, Anthony Palmer, who is continually dealing with health issues, we ask you to, to be with him. Father, we, we ask you to be with uh, uh, my wife, Regina, as she deals with uh, a health issue this morning, and we ask that you just protect her, Father. Just please be with them, uh, grant them comfort. Um, be with our youth, as always. Uh, protect them, Father. Protect them from the temptations, all the temptations and evil and all the things that are going on in this, in this fallen world. We ask you to Help those of us who are older and more mature in the faith to, to just be the best Christian role models we can be for our youth, Father, so that they can learn how to imitate us as we do our best to imitate you, Father. And we ask you to be with this country as it deals with so many divisions and so much wickedness and such a disgusting and wicked culture that we're in right now. Just ask you to be with the leaders and of this country and just change their hearts and have them lead us in the direction that is, according, is in accordance with your word, Father. Father, we as saints here, we just pray that we can continue to try to love each other in a way that, in the way that you love us, Father, and continue to be with us and be patient with us as we do so. And we just ask all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Before a speaker comes to us this morning, again, I would like to return with me or to sing with me the song 423, Master, the Tempest is Raging. One, two, and three. Master, the tempest is raging, 
Church. Morning, Charlie. We welcome all those who have decided to be here today and to fellowship with us as we continue to serve God in the best way that we know how. Every day has a beginning, and it's nice to know that it begins with the Lord. Amen. For if not, we would have not have risen this morning. Uh, therefore, we have much to be thankful for. Amen. Someone didn't open their eyes this morning, and last night someone went to judgment. We're asking that uh, as we continue to strive, that we would continue to remember to pray for one another uh, on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis because we never know when uh, God may reappear. Having said that, then, Realizing that we're living in times that are not convenient or conducive to the soul, depending on your perspective of how you look at it, God promised us that the, being a Christian was going to be a fiery trial of uh, temptations, trials that were going to embrace us in order to prevent us uh, from being with him in eternity. But eternity should be on the menu as we continue to desire uh, to be with him uh, there in a place where there is no more conflict, uh, no more doubting, no more sickness, uh, no more anything <laughs> except joy, peace, and uh, knowing that we would be in the a presence of God. It's nice to know that also that as God has delegated, uh, I will say, a method uh, to bring us to him. One that we don't always realize, but certainly we are uh, impressed with as we develop in knowledge and understanding of who God is how he abides with us uh, in this present moment. We read scripture and we realize that he said where two or three are gathered. But God is always in the masses. He's everywhere. When we look into the sky or into the sea, when we look down here on earth, we see the evidence of God's presence. We have a continual reminder of that as we continue to grow old. Aging is a part of the process that helps us to realize that we can't stop what God has already implemented and set into motion. If we could, some of us would live uh, forever. But forever is not on our menu. It's not within our grasp nor power. But it belongs to the Almighty. Him who abides and gives us life. This morning we want to continue to broaden our perspective and look at the activity of the Holy Spirit in our lives. For it is only by the power of the Holy Spirit that God gives us, that he keeps a, a constant communion with us uh, because we are washed by the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We understand this uh, to the depth of implementing it. We always fear something until fear shows up and we understand that if we're in the Lord, we have uh, no, we should not have fear. But nonetheless, because of our human nature, we have been 
brought uh, to a situation where we have fear constantly about so many things. But think in terms of God is in us and he's there with us to help us to overcome the fears that we have. In the book of Romans, chapter 8, uh, verses 7 and 9 is going to uh, be the time that we're able to discuss this subject, have you resisted the spirit? Have you personally resisted the power of God that's in you uh, by allowing yourselves to be constantly bombarded with fear, negativity, always being uh, pressured and shaped and manipulated by the fear that resides up here. This can be a deafening thought uh, that hinders us from approaching God through faith. Anything that's going to block us uh, from serving and getting closer in our covenant relationship with God ought to be removed, however so slowly or gradually, it must be removed and out of our way so that we can walk toward God clearly with a mind that's clear, with a heart that's clear, uh, where our consciences are clean and our hearts are made to be whole. Being devout is a reflection on how we walk with God, how we continue uh, to grow as evidence uh, that we have been flowered uh, by God's uh, great favor toward us in our mundane lives. Jesus said in John 8 and 34, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committed sin uh, is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house ever. Let me stop right there and inform you this morning uh, that as we uh, continue to have this relationship with God, uh, we commune with him uh, not just once a week, but every day. Every day God is in our lives. And that communion is a constant contact with the energy of the forces that come from heaven and it's not ingratiated by our own power. When we recognize that we are baptized believers based on the confession, the oath that we made that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and from that point that we began to walk with God, uh, we made some uh, promises that we would continue to walk with him was one of those promises. That we would con continually abide in the, uh, uh, the, the activity of the Holy Spirit. How can you actively participate with something that you don't know about? How? Can two walk together except they be in agreement? The agreement comes from us uh, by the dedication that we show uh, through the Spirit that we are the sons and daughters of God. Every one that walks with him has a mind uh, that's focused on eternity and not temporary. Many of us, we think on the temporary plane because uh, we think that uh, we can do whatever we want and God is not looking. God sees what we're thinking. 
He already knows what we're going to be doing in two years from now. He looks down the funnel of time because time is in his hand. None of us owns time, but God owns it. He is time. He can stop it whenever he wants and begin it again so that everything turns back. But think about who we are dealing with, the mindset of God, that we can't know but only see increments of him uh, through the enlightenment of the scriptures. We go about our daily activities uh, thinking that this is what I'll do and this is what I'll do and I'll go on this vacation and, and I'll visit my uh, uh, long-lost relatives uh, this month and we're making plans all the time for things that we don't know whether they're going to materialize or not. The time that we have is the time that we're in, and that's right now. Yes. It's a blessed thing to know that we're in the house where God's people meet. Yes. Uh, we are, uh, 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 and that he's in our midst, enlightening us uh, through that which he has uh, righteous uh, contact with, and that is the spirit that is in us. It's the spirit that provokes us and helps to shape and mold our character, how we answer to this character that we should be developing, uh, uh, who walk after, not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Well, let's look at uh, verse 7, where it uh, helps to uh, increase us with an, uh, with an awareness uh, where it says the sinful mind is hostile to God. God has nothing to do with the sinful mind. When we hold anger, when we hold vengeance, when we hold doubt, these are the elements that causes uh, an impediment uh, between me and my Savior. Uh, when we are uh, uh, rude, uh, when we are disorderly, uh, when we harbor bad thoughts about one another, uh, uh, these things impede us. Uh, where grace should abound, where forgiveness uh, should be uh, blown uh, to the highest uh, equity that uh, we are able uh, to channel uh, the idea uh, that our thoughts represent us. Whatsoever man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Think evil, be evil. Think nice, be nice. And you can't fool God. You can show me the smile, but there's a frown in your heart. Don't make sense, it will. When you get to the judgment, God will repeat it for you. The sinful mind being hostile, there is no breach because it's dark. It does not submit. Shouldn't we submit? Well, let me... Let me make it plain for you. Don't want to lose that spot. But I want to talk about submission. When we submit to God, we do what God says. Am I right about it? Oh, I'm getting it plain this morning. I'm dropping back to, am I right about it? I'm only right about it where the Bible says amen. Yes. Yes. Then you ought to say amen. God is right about it. <laughs> when we see that uh, when it gets to the point where we have to make a decision about will I serve God or will I serve my pleasure? Will I do what I want to do and sacrifice what God says that we should do? When we get to a point 
where family supersedes God, then we are saying that God, I'll put you on uh, the shelf for a little while, but I won't forget that you're there. I'll come back. And uh, uh, we'll pick up where uh, 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 I ended it. God don't work like that. God works on a time frame of when you least expect him is when he will show up. We need to make things uh, absolutely clear uh, so that we can digest uh, the urgency of the matter of where we are in our spiritual lives. I'm 70, I ain't going to say the rest, <laughs> but I know that my time is running out. When we recognize by my own facial uh, stability that I try to take care of this as much as I can. Y'all do that too, don't you? But all of this is falling apart. Yeah, we worried about the head, but the, the rest of it is falling apart. And all we can do is hide it behind new suits. New shoes, new blouses, new hats. It took me a long time to realize uh, that uh, I was losing my hair. And now I don't care about it not being there. I am who I am. But thank God, the good news is, I got another body that's waiting for me that you can't see. I got a spiritual body that's waiting on me, so I'll put up with the inconvenience of this small frame that I had. Uh, God didn't give me what I wanted, but he gave me what I need. When we understand the limitations of us, uh, where God is, and where he wants us to be, is where he put us we begin to learn uh, the same thing that uh, Paul learned and then wrote about, uh, that he had learned where we have to be content with what? The things that he had. He wasn't worried about what other folk had. He was thankful for what he had. And thank God, I have a right mind to know where I ought to be on the Lord's day. Amen. Am I right about it? Oh, say Amen. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit. The first thing we ought to learn how to do is submit. Submit uh, to one another in the fear of God. Uh, don't join in on conversations uh, that are not healthy, but help to uh, direct them uh, to the wholesomeness of a conversation because there's always a negative and a positive than in anything that we do. You can always find a, a bright uh, idea out of a negative one that has been put forth. You know that old cliche about uh, out of every dark cloud, there's a silver line. Well, out of every wrong, there is a right. We need to find and do what's right. Nor can it do so. The power of ne negativity cannot breach the light, uh, the knowledge of God. Uh, the dark mind cannot absorb uh, the uh, knowledge, uh, the idea uh, that God has said that there's righteousness in the things that he has availed toward us. Those that are controlled by the sinful nature cannot understand how uh, to approach God because we have been uh, laid with the layers of sin according to our life and the things that we have associated with. It corrupts us. It stops us uh, from doing what we ought to do. 
We have negative friends. If you stay around them, uh, they, that negativity uh, will show up in you. And you won't be aware. And then, but those that are in the church are aware. See, that's the good thing. Uh, God says, okay, now that you are my child, I put a spirit in you that's going to remind you, and now you can't say, I didn't know, Lord. Because God is going to say through the Spirit, you're grieving me. You're denying me. You're not reading about the Lord. Therefore, you're not feeding me. You're starving me. You're making me so that I become uh, ineffective in your life because uh, that, uh, that devil, uh, that demon, uh, that negative knowledge that you have in you is, is blocking uh, the light that's shining in you. And you know what? The spirit goes dimmer and dimmer and dimmer until you snuff him out. And then God gives you over to a reprobate mind. We have the opportunity this morning to escape all of that. Uh, those that are controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the spirit. See, there's good news for those who have confessed Christ, have dedicated their lives to him so that every obstacle that are put before you with the help of God and the fact of your confidence and your knowledge, your faith is being strengthened by the struggles that you come through. Every last one of us are being tried with something that's in our lives that's causing us uh, to hold back moving forward. And even when we move forward, uh, we do it in increments and we should be looking at the evidence of I've moved a little closer to God because I put away lying, cheating, stealing. I put away bad company, bad conversation, evil thoughts. This is a process. And it doesn't come uh, by just asking for those things. You have to actually participate and the reality of it becoming uh, to a conclusion that I have been saved by a God that I can't see with my naked eyes, but I see him by faith because I continually am in motivated. I'm recharged in the spirit of God and God lives in me. As I close, I look at the time limit here and realize that there's so much that could be said. But for the lack of time, because we live in a busy world and we live amongst the busy people who are always doing everything that they, well, I wouldn't say everything, but a lot of things that we shouldn't be doing we've already made reservations for. You may not get to complete those reservations one day. God knows the day and the time that he's coming back. And what we do know, it's going to be in the twinkling of an eye. The bat of an eye lasts and God is here. Judgment would have come. And we will be undone if we are involved in an activity that God doesn't endorse. Let your life and the track record of your life be the evidence of your love toward the Father. Amen. Because everything goes through the Son, for there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. One day, all of the vacations, the trips, and everything that we plan for 
but did not implement God in the plan. See, it's all right to go everywhere you want to go, but make sure that on the day, on the first day of the week, that God rose, that the power of what he did toward us, for all of us, because he's no respecter of person, but he blessed us so that we would remember him on this day. Forget about your birthday. Forget about the day that you were married. I'm not saying forget about it. I'm just saying in the sequence of what's important, God first and everything else is second. If God ain't in it in the plan, forget about it. It's a bad plan. I give you my number, but uh, I know a bunch of y'all will be calling me later. <laughs> but let me say this, and then I'll take my seat. That while we are lost, it's because you don't read the word. In order to pass any test, this is just a common sense test this morning, but because we read the information that they give us in high school and in college and for our jobs, and we take the time to sit down and, and to look over so we know that information backwards and forwards. We're talking about going to heaven, which is more important. You graduating or you going to heaven? Because that's the only graduation that you really, truly are going to be denied if you have not studied his book. Amen. Jesus said, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. They are they that testify of me. If you don't know about your creator, don't worry about graduating. You hear, believe, repent, confess, you're baptized. But that puts you into Christ. But to stay in Christ, you've got to read the information. May God bless and keep you. And by the power of his back, as we continue to serve. Will you all stand, please, as we... Sing our invitation song. Stand please, stand please.
As we prepare our hearts and our minds to partake of the Lord's Supper, I do hope and trust that our hearts may be at the right place to receive these emblems and that we do so in a heart and a mind that is pleasing to Almighty God. Before, the, before we do so, I'd like you to turn with me to hymn number 155. We we'll sing to the old rugged cross. <clears throat> On a hill far away stood that old rugged cross, the emblem and suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the day So I'll 
If not, please raise your hand and we'll have someone bring one to you. There we go, in the back. Communion must take place in an atmosphere of self-examination and repentance. In 1 Corinthians, it says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty in returning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself, and then so eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. There are things we really need to... Think about as we partake of communion. Remember that Christ, our Savior, died on the cross for the sins of all mankind. We need to proclaim his death on the cross. We need to give thanks. We need to examine our hearts. We need to commune with God and our fellow believers. We need to acknowledge his covenant with him, we need to anticipate, anticipate his return. We're blessed to be able to have this time and this opportunity to remember him and to uh, celebrate this great gift that has been given to us. We read in Luke that he took the bread and gave thanks. And broke, he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup, the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. We have now this opportunity to partake of both the bread and the cup as a reminder of that suffering that he undertook on the cross for our sake. I always think of the many things that he had to go through, the beatings and the pain and suffering. We need to think of that as we remember him in our prayers. Would you bow with me as we pray? Our Father, we're just so thankful that we do have this opportunity that we can come to remember that great gift that you gave us in your son who suffered so, that, so much just that we could have that hope of eternal life. We thank you, Father, now as we participate in this tremendous memorial. We thank you for this bread that was given for our salvation. Now as we partake of the bread, let us be mindful of that body which is shed on the cross for us. Amen. As we continue, would you bow with me again, please? Our Father, as we continue this memorial, help us be mindful of the blood that was shed as it came pouring down off that cross, the tremendous pain and suffering that you undertook. We thank you 
we remember you, we praise you in all the things that you've done for us. Please forgive us for the many things we fail to do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We've been given an opportunity at this time to return a portion of that which we've been given as a gift, the many blessings that we have in our lives, the things that have helped us through all the days of giving, that you've given us, we just need to be giving back a portion we're thankful for this congregation and its tremendous gifts that they've been given and be able to reach out and to support many and the missionaries that we support and, and so many other needs. We just are thankful. We need to be thankful for Jesus and his love. Please bow with me now as we give thanks for this offering. Father, as we now participate in this time of giving, Help us, encourage us to be mindful of the needs of so many. Help us, Father, not only to give financially, but to give of ourselves as we go out into the world, that we can be an example for you, that we can reach out and see the needs of others and help them. We're just so thankful for all your many blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. For our closing hymn, we sing 446. <clears throat> when my way groweth there, precious Lord, linger near. When my life is almost gone, hear my cry, hear my thought. Precious Lord, lame and fall, take my hand. Precious Lord, lead me on. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am willing. I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me. Please bow with me as we close in prayer. Almost high, Father God, which art in heaven, we're grateful for this day that you've allowed us to see, another day that was not promised, another day that you woke us in our right minds, dear Father. We thank you for directing us to this place this morning. We thank Brother Charlie Pierce for his moving and meaningful sermon this morning. We thank you so much for Quentin and his class this morning. We thank you, dear Lord, for the leadership of this church and congregation. We ask, Father God, that you be with us for the remainder of the day, that you give us safety as we travel from here 
but to not put you too far back in our minds, for we should serve you for the entire day. We ask, dear Lord, that you be with those that were not able to be in person, but worshipped online, being the streaming services that we provide. We're so thankful for your love and for your son and for your dear son, Jesus the Christ, who hung blood and died on the cross and rose on the third day. And like us, his body did not see decay, but as Charlie spoke, one day we will. We're so grateful, Father God, for all the things that you do for us. We're nothing without you. We say these words through Jesus the Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Got a few announcements. First, we want to make sure that you hang around if you can. We have some food, some refreshments as we celebrate uh, our sister Beverly Sutherland. This is her last 